Albert Einstein said, Never do anything against conscience, even if the state demands it. And well, that's pretty much the message of the Bible too. The Bible tells us that we should follow the civil law at all times until such a point that it contradicts the moral law and that where the two diverge, we must always go with the moral law alone. Now let us tread carefully here and firstly emphasize how important it is that Christians follow the civil law to the best of their ability. Paul tells us, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honour you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes too for these same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them, and give respect and honour to those who are in authority. Paul in fact urges us to pray for those in authority, saying, I urge you first of all to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Titus 3.1 tells us, Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. Peter tells us, For the Lord's sake, respect all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. Don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God and respect the king. And of course, Jesus himself, when asked about whether to pay taxes, said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So generally, Christians are called to be the best, most honest and law-abiding citizens in any society. However, when the civil law brings us into conflict with God's eternal moral law and his commands, we must part ways and follow God only. Daniel is a great example of this. The officials in Babylon were looking for a crime that they could charge him for. The Bible says that when they tried to dig up some dirt to convict him, they actually couldn't find any. He was always faithful, always responsible and completely trustworthy. He was a model citizen. So to trap him, they decided to create a law that they knew he wouldn't keep. They passed a law that contradicted God's moral law, saying that anyone who prayed to anyone other than the king should be executed. Of course, Daniel couldn't do this because he would then be guilty of idolatry. Only God should receive our prayers. So when he learned about the new law, he simply went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its window open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he always had done, giving thanks to God. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for this crime, but God famously honoured him for his courage and integrity by shutting the mouths of the lions, and he was not killed. A similar thing happened with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They were ordered by King Nebuchadnezzar to bow down and worship an idol. Rather than go against God, they refused to obey the orders, and when they did, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious that he threatened to throw them into a fiery furnace. The three godly boys responded boldly, saying, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. And they too were saved from the executions by God. We find the same courage and integrity in the apostles who were told to stop spreading the gospel of Jesus. They defiantly replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The Bible reports that they then continue to teach and preach this message, Jesus is the Messiah. They too consequently found themselves in and out of jail, facing beatings in the process. They actually became proud of their scars because they knew for whom they had suffered and it gave them a chance to identify with the suffering of their saviour. 
Indeed, throughout all history, this has always been the way of things for Christians, to be the most peaceful, law-abiding, trustworthy and faithful citizens in a community, up until such a point where the government turns on them and tells them to contradict their conscience and the moral law. At this point, they diverge from the civil law and continue following God regardless of the consequences. Our predecessors have done this and we must also do this, not forgetting or being ignorant of who is really behind such immoral law changes. We know who our spiritual enemy is, we know of his vain ambitions, how he hates us, and we know how he tries to use both manipulation and intimidation against us when we threaten his kingdom. But we can't back down in this battle, it's simply not an option. Early Christians in Rome were persecuted for not bowing down to Caesar or worshipping pagan gods. The reformers and Bible translators were pursued, jailed and killed for giving the Bible to people in their own languages. John Bunyan protested about freedom of religion and was frequently imprisoned. The abolitionists and people like Martin Luther King Jr. employed civil disobedience for their cause. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Niemöller resisted the Nazis. These and many others like them faced prison and death, preferring to be faithful to God rather than accept immoral laws, and that's our responsibility too. Martin Luther King Jr. said, We must never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. What's legal and illegal comes second to what's right and wrong. Where God and man contradict one another, we must follow God. Alexander Bickel said, We cannot by total reliance on law escape the duty to judge right and wrong. There are good laws and there are occasionally bad laws, and it conforms to the highest traditions of a free society to offer resistance to bad laws and to disobey them. Clarence Darrow said, as long as the world shall last, there will be wrongs, and if no man objected and no man rebelled, those wrongs would last forever. Martin Luther King Jr. again said, Never, never be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our own soul when we look the other way. Jesus himself said, Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. All of these quotations inform us of the principle that God is our highest moral authority. He is the good apple and the midday sun by which we make all our moral judgments. These words of wisdom further inform us that government, when it decides to detach itself from God, is actually capable of great evil and oppression, and that such things should be opposed for the good of all. They further tell us that submission to government does not mean uncritical obedience. We don't become machines who can shirk responsibility for our actions. When the Nazi officials told the soldiers to gas innocent humans in concentration camps, the individual soldiers still had a decision to make about whether to obey the command. Immoral laws contrary to God's will are to be disobeyed. Now Christian civil disobedience should always be non-violent and those who engage in it should be willing to face the consequences. But as Luther King Jr. says, the wounds society inflicts are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our own soul when we go along with the moral laws. Don't be manipulated or intimidated into silence. The world needs our courage. And finally, we must not think of persecution for being a Christian as something unusual. To those of us who come from Western countries with a Christian influence, it may seem unusual to us. But the truth is that we have been the exceptions to the rule. Throughout all history, and even in most parts of the world today, suffering has been and remains the norm for Christians. Jesus told his disciples, This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. He prayed for us, saying, 
The world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. We will be hated. We have to get used to that. It's a natural consequence of belonging to Jesus in a world ruled by the evil one. We have to try to love and save those who would persecute us anyway. Finally, it was Peter who wrote, Be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian, for then the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. If we're to suffer, it can't be for immoral behaviour. We can't defend the moral law by breaking the moral law. We must in all other senses be perfect citizens. But it is no shame to be persecuted for being a Christian who obeys the will of God.